Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the city of Seaside Mill Ponds Natural History Park. My name is Michelle. And I'm Mike. He's my dad. And today we are going to take you on a virtual tour of this site. This place started out as a gravel quarry, which was used to construct the Astoria Airport um, up about 20 miles north of here. And then it was later converted into a shingle mill and then an alder mill. The alder mill burned down a few decades ago, and then the land was acquired by the city of Seaside uh, with the help of the North Coast Land Conservancy in 1999. And there has been a community-led effort for the last several years to turn this place into a proper natural history park where people can spend time and enjoy the beautiful natural setting that we're in. So we're very excited to share this place with you today and we're gonna take you with us on a little hike around and we're gonna see what kind of cool naturey stuff we can see. We're gonna start here at the freshwater pond, then we're gonna take you across the pond and go and explore the wetland. Then we're going to move over to the tidally influenced pond, which has a little bit of salt water mixed in with its fresh water. And then we're going to take you over to the disturbed area of the site and talk about how the industrial history of the site has impacted the species that have moved in there. So without further ado, come on, let's go start our tour. So now we're on the other side of the pond from where we were. And as we've been walking around, you can definitely still see the remnants of this site's industrial past. This whole pond area is man-made. It wasn't here before they started mining for gravel 130 years ago. And you can still see the cobble along the edges of these islands and uh, little spits that are sticking out. And that's the cobble that they were trying to collect. Back in the day, it was easier for them to collect pre-crushed rock than to crush their own. Right. Yeah. Lots of birds especially come to this pond because it's full of aquatic life that they can feed on in the winter time. And it's also home to a lot of really neat plant life, you know, because we've got native sedges and stuff off um, on the islands. There's that gnarly spruce tree there that's really neat. There is some cow's parsnip out there. There's a uh, native twinberry, which the hum hummingbirds really like, some Pacific nine bark, lots and lots of alder. Lots of native trees have, and, and shrubs have moved into this area. So even though it's been disturbed, it's coming back with many native species. But the non-native species are like a really important part of the site too, because they're also part of the community and have an impact on all the other organisms in this area. And so we mostly want to just put our energy into the non-native species that have a tendency not to play well with others. Right, like yeah. the copious quantities of blackberry here. And, but, and the reed canary grass. Yeah, that stuff is nasty too. <laughs> and the ivy, there's all sorts of stuff all over this place. It's really cool that you can still see all of the native species that have come in, in spite of this being basically a completely man-made site. It's recovering many of the things that it had before we started mining gravel out here. Yeah, that's really cool. It's cool to see nature always coming back and stuff. Should we go over to the... Uh... Yeah, let's go over to the wetlands and see if there's any dragonflies flying. I bet you there'll be damselflies. Damselflies for sure. All right, let's head in that direction then. This is my favorite part of the whole walk. Is oh, really? Right here. Oh, yeah, it's, I'm kind of glad that they're not going to be messing with this too much. Yep. And of course, my favorite, uh, native northwest berry. Uh, ivy? Native, <laughs> dad, native. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, thimbleberry, thimble I know. Thimbleberry, yeah. Yeah. It looks a little bit like a raspberry, tastes a little bit like a raspberry, it's a little bit milder. This is one of my favorite native northwest berries, um, at least for eating. Um, but I also like the big fuzzy leaves. Did or, you find a salmonberry over there? Yeah, this is just a little tiny one. Oh yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Well, you remember we were going to talk about salmonberry here too? This oh, is yeah. salmonberry. And uh, one of my favorite field marks for salmonberry, which I learned from uh, Katie Volke, uh, North Coast Land Conservancy. This is the salmonberry here. And one of the ways you can tell it from a blackberry is that it has three leaves, like this. And when you fold the top leaf down, you get a butterfly. A butterfly. Yeah. Oh, this is this is one of the two willow species, native willow species that we have out here. This is a Pacific willow. Um, it has these pointy tips to it, long, thin, sword-like leaves with pointy tips. Um, and the other willow is over here. This is this is the uh, coast willow, and you can see the leaves are are broader looking. They don't have quite a sharp point. Um, they're also thicker and they have a pale back to them. 
So this is the coast willow. This is actually a little more common than the Pacific willow that we just looked at. All right, so out here on this kind of spit, we've got some great wetland habitat. We've got a whole bunch of really interesting rushes and sedges and different kinds of grass, native and non-native. And um, one of the most fun parts about this part of the site is the fact that you really kind of need boots. It goes up to your knees in some places. So we're gonna try not to swamp anything today. Um, but I'm gonna head out in that direction so we can talk about the cattails a little bit and how they affect like the different bird species and stuff. And I'm gonna stay here where my feet don't get wet because that's how I roll. These are all native wetland plants here, by the way. And, and uh, this is, has less gravel on the bottom of it because it actually has fill from the, uh, that part of the side over there. They've actually shoveled in real dirt over the top of this part here, which gives it a different base uh, for the plants to grow on. And that's why we see more wetland plants on this side than we do on some of the other parts of the pond. Some rushes and some sedges and some cattails and uh, they all are obligate wetland species. They have to be here. Um, they can't grow in, in, in the drier parts. Right. If you want to follow me, I can take you out to where the cattails are. So the really neat thing about cattails is that they're kind of the filters of the wetland. I mean, all wetland plants filter to a certain extent, but cattails are a really good indicator of how chemicals build up in different places. So a lot of places that are trying to restore a certain amount of wetland after they've disturbed them is to plant cattails and they actually end up kind of soaking up toxins out of the water and out of the soil. And so they do a really good job of like breaking things down and um, making sure that uh, pollutants get kind of dealt with in a natural way. The insides of the stalks are edible. You can cook them up kind of like celery. They taste a little bit like cucumber. It's kind of weird. And then they actually produce a starchy tuber down in the mud. But because they're so good at filtering toxins, you have to be really, really careful where you go out and collect them. First of all, you want to make sure that you don't pick them on a place where you're not supposed to harvest wild plants or animals. And you also want to make sure that you don't collect them along the sides of roads or near sewage facilities because they are really good at just soaking up and sponging up all of those toxins that are in the water and in the in whatever soil or substrate that they're um, that they're growing in. So, but they're also super necessary to like the other um, wetland creatures that are out here. A lot of birds, especially, will wait until the cattails actually go to seed because they produce these long, kind of corn dog-looking um, flowers that eventually turn into these huge puffs. And so, if you've ever like driven across a, or driven by a by a wetland, you'll sometimes see these big puffs on stalks, and those are the those are the seeding cattail flowers. And birds will gather up that fluff and use it to line their nests in, in place of down sometimes. So it's um it's really cool to see um, these growing out here because they are a great indicator of wetland health, and um, they're also super necessary for birds that we've been seeing flying around here, like red-winged blackbirds or any of the thrushes or sparrow species or wrens that have been moving around out here as we've been walking around and taking this tour. Towards the shoreline here, not that there really is a defined shoreline, these are a sedge and again you can see these lovely seed heads here. These were the flowering heads of the plants and now they are producing seeds. Um, and there's a fun little rhyme to help you identify what kind of wetland plant you're looking at. Sedges have edges rushes are round, and grasses have bends where nodules are found. This is a rush. I'm not sure what species, but this is um, what the flowering uh, seed head looks like, and you can actually still see some of the stamens on it. Um, they're mixed in with different native and non-native grasses, and we're going to explain in a little bit the difference between native and non-native species, um, and also the difference between non-native and invasive species, because that is an important distinction to make. Um, but for now, I think we should probably head back and see if my dad is able to find any cool birds or any other things uh, on the site. So let's head back this way and also get out of this mud. Oh, there's a rose in flower. Oh, there you go. Good eyes. You got a flowering uh, Nootka rose right here. Black capped chickadees up over here somewhere. Oh. Good morning, sweetheart. You. Still chilly. 
all the way up in the top of the tree. He knows it's us. He knows it's people. The bird that we're hearing in the trees goes with that feather right there. This is Stellar's Jay. There, that's uh, Cascara, another uh, native species. Good berry plant for birds. So this site is really neat because of its industrial history. And I'm actually sitting on a piece of it right now. Um, this site started as a gravel mill where they would pull up pieces of cobblestone uh, from, the, from this kind of wide, flat basin. And they would cart it about 20 miles north to the Astoria Airport uh, because they were working on constructing it at the time. And then after that, this, uh, this site was flooded so that it could become a shingle mill and then an alder mill so that they could kind of float logs in and um, have them go into the mill more easily. Now, the mill burned down a few decades ago, and the city of Seaside and some other independent people decided that they wanted to try to preserve the site. And so in 1999, working alongside the North Coast Land Conservancy, the city bought the property and have been working for quite a while now, actually, to turn it into a real established nature park. So it's kind of neat that we can still see evidence of the site's industrial history prominently, because it's a, it's a huge part of what shaped this place. So we're over here at the pond that has a little bit more tidal influence to it. So this means that the water level rises and falls throughout the day. And there's also some salt water mixed in with the fresh water around here. And we call water like that brackish water, which means that it has a, a different set of plants and animals that like to live in and around it. The main reason why it rises and falls here is, is strictly tidal. You can see there are a couple of little notches in the shoreline across on the other side. Those are actually places that connect this pond to the Neawana Creek, which is actually flowing. Um, during heavy rains, the Neawana will produce enough water that it actually overflows into this pond. Um, during the summer, um, you can see the tide go up and down more because there's not as much water coming in from, from up in the hills, and so you, the uh, the tidal influence can be seen uh, much more easily. But you can also get a sense of where the water is during different parts of the day um, by looking at where the, where the algae is along the edge. Those gray mats are uh, the same kind of algae that's floating in the pond out here. And when the tide goes down, they get stuck and they dry out. And then when the water comes up, they rehydrate and, um, and act like the stuff that's out in, in, in the water. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about native, non-native, and invasive species, and I feel like we should take a moment here to kind of explain what we're talking about. Native species are basically species that evolved here and are set parts of the ecosystem kind of from the beginning. Historically, they're what's been here. Non-native species are species that have been brought in from other parts of the world, and they could have either been brought in accidentally or on purpose, like uh, our good old friend Scotch Broom here. Scotch broom was brought in back, when, when was Scotch broom brought in? I don't even remember. Back during the Eisenhower administration, uh, mostly, they were actually using it um, as road cover. Um, it grew well in disturbed areas, and so they were using it to plant along roadsides, and it, it got away from them. Yep. Yeah, um, and this is a really good example of not just a non-native species. But an invasive. An invasive non-native species. species. There are a lot of non-native species here, and so the real issue is whether it is invasive to the point that it starts crowding out other species and, be, and, and forms what we call a monoculture, where there's nothing but that plant growing. Scotch broom is a really good example of something that forms a monoculture. The blackberry is a very good example of something that forms a monoculture. The reed canary grass. Reed canary grass forms a monoculture. The knotweed, that forms a monoculture. And so those are the really the problematic non-native species. It's hard to know where to put the cutoff point for non-native species when you think about it. Do you cut it off at uh, 20,000 years? Do you cut it off at 200 years? When does it become native? It really is the invasive ones that we find problematic and, and, and need to worry about. And we're going to see a lot of them at the disturbed site, which I think we're about to head to next. That's right. There's plenty of uh, disturbance at the disturbed site. <laughs> yeah, wise guy. All right, let's head in that direction then. Okay. Song Sparrow singing. 
So now we find ourselves kind of at the disturbed section of the site. This does kind of count as its own little ecosystem in here. And this is where a lot of the history of the site took place. It's the original site of the, of the, of the mill that was um, on this piece of property. And apparently you were saying earlier that there was a yard debris dump over there? Well, not an official one. Um, ah. <laughs> back in the day before they had this gated off, uh, people could drive in here and, and, and they would dump their yard debris over in this spot. And if you uh, know your uh, house plants and garden plants, there's actually quite a few interesting plants that have an origin from the yard debris that, was, that used to be dumped here. We're interested in this part of the site too because it obviously has historical significance, but also we get to see a lot of how plants move in immediately after a site is disturbed. So this part of the park is kind of like a window into the early years after the mill was burned down basically because different places go through different stages of regrowth and nature kind of taking back over. So we started over in places that have had a lot of time to recover. And this place hasn't had as much time to recover because it's still so close to the city shops. And there's also a road right over there and we can you know, hear with our own ears you know, all of the different truck sounds and the highway going by in the distance. And so this site is just a lot closer to all of that. And so it offers us a really kind of unique look at how different plants and animals move back into a space after people leave it. In these disturbed sites, um, because of the soil compaction and, and the low nutrient uh, load in the soil, uh, there are only certain plants that do well here. And one of them are, uh, is this bird's foot tree foal right here that has the yellow flower. Um, there are some other plants that are closely related. These are all in the bean family and they have the ability to extract nitrogen from the air and turn it into fertilizers. So in this case, all of these plants are able to fertilize themselves by extracting nitrogen and making nitrogen fertilizers. And so a lot of the plants that you'll see around here are plants that are either very good at coming in quickly and uh, getting their reproductive work done or plants that can kind of make their own fertilizer and make their own nutrient source over time that nutrients those nutrients will build up in the soil and it will become more like some of these other places that we see around the edge assuming we don't come in with tractors and dig everything up and help things along by decompacting the soil right so we've seen throughout the course of this uh, virtual tour how amazing this site is in terms of its ecology and the plants and animals that live here but there is a plan in the works to make it even more amazing. The city of Seaside and a lot of amazing community volunteers have put together a plan to make this trail more accessible to a broader variety of people. So right here on this trail that we can see going off into the distance, there's going to be a new loop that goes around the freshwater pond that will be wheelchair accessible and ADA compliant, which is pretty cool. Now, of course, Given the current time that we're living in, it's been a little bit more difficult for people to get out and enjoy nature to the same capacity that they used to. So while we're also taking you on this virtual tour with us, we have another option for you. Those same amazing city volunteers have gotten together and commissioned a local artist to create a free coloring book that features a whole bunch of the different plants and animals that we've talked about at the site, and it will be free to download in the description below. So that's another thing that you can do in order to celebrate all of the amazing stuff that we've seen today. So even if you can't leave the comfort and safety of your own home currently, you can still enjoy and celebrate all of the cool stuff that we've been able to show you today. And so the link to that will be in the description box below and you can enjoy it whenever you wish. Well, that concludes our tour for the day. We had an amazing time bringing you around with us and showing you some of the great natural features of this site. We had a great time looking at the freshwater ponds and the brackish ponds and all of the plants and animals that we took a look at today. And remember, these natural spaces are always out here for you to enjoy. Now, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we have the coloring book so that you can continue to appreciate the great native plants and animals um, of the site. And if you find that you can, come out here and enjoy the Seaside Mill Ponds Natural History Park. Thank you so much for coming with us today, and we hope to see you around soon. Thanks. <laughs>